Hey, it's syndicated radio talk show host, author, singer, Al Cole, welcoming you to another edition of People of Distinction, the talk that gives an in-depth view of some of the most dynamic, intelligent, and successful people on the planet. Welcome, Eleanor, to People of Distinction with Al Cole. It's a pleasure to have you on today. How are you, Eleanor? I'm fine. First of all, thank you for having me and allowing me to talk about One Caregiver's Journey. And I'm going to have you talk about it. I've been introducing it. But you're the caregiver. You know what you're talking about. So yeah, go for it. Tell us about your book and about that nine and a half stint of uh, challenges in caregiving and also nine and a half years of helping people in very uh, in, in ways that actually helped you as well. Tell us about this. Well, um, my mother fell and broke her hip uh, at the age of 93 when we were at my brother's home for dinner. And so... I gave up full-time employment shortly thereafter to become a full-time caregiver. And um, during my nine and a half year where I was, I was the sole caregiver and she lived with me in my home, um, I began to journal my daily occurrences. And as the years passed, I began to wonder if my experiences would help somebody else in, in their challenges and changes as a caregiver. So that's kind of how I got to uh, a book. And um, there's a thing that I, I refer to it as transition. And we all, when you become a caregiver, you actually cease being an adult child and you become being the parent. And the transition to caregiving can be lightning speed with unforeseen accident or illness, as in my case. Otherwise, the caregiving transition evolves over a long, long period of time due to age and age-related issues. Hmm. Caregiving in and of itself can be a very exhaustive experience because it requires that you give your full attention to the job at hand, as good or as bad as a day may be. I refer to it as finding balance as a relative term in caregiving, and it's somewhere in between rest and exasperating stress, and it looks different in everybody's lives. And I feel that balance allows us the physical and mental means to stand up to the chaos in our world, and it might just be the act of, accept, of accepting some grace in your daily life, not only for caregiving, but otherwise, because the transition into caregiving comes with a ton of challenges. Um, my, if, if you, any of your listeners are currently providing elder or senior care or thinking of becoming an in-home caregiver to a relative, um, one caregiver's journey just might be a must read. Mm -hmm. The book has been, called a treasure trove of suggestions and information that could lighten the burdens of a care, caregiver. There are many similar situations in caregiving, but my book reflect, reflects on nine and a half years. And because my book is chronological, um, it really provides a snapshot into the reality of the stages and changes and challenges I faced over the years in which I think many other people will face. It started out as, as basically when my mother came home from the rehab facility after she fell and broke her hip, it was, it was a learning process of how do you, how do you deal with the daily things? And you, you, all of a sudden, you're responsible for virtually all the care of someone, giving them a shower, helping them navigate, <clears throat> cooking three meals a day, uh, cleaning the house, doing the laundry, doing doing the shopping, and, and pretty much everything that evolves around their life becomes part of your life. And um, I had a – I cruised along pretty much from 93 to about 97 or 98 as, as her memory became worse, but, but she, was, she was mobile. She was mobile. She was a happy, docile soul. My mother was just – um, I have, I have often said that, um, 
caregiving was difficult and challenging at times, but my mother was not. She was just a happy, docile soul. Mm -hmm. And then there came a period of when she was between 98 and 99, and she had just numerous health issues then started right after Christmas and lasted well into the spring. And she had pneumonia, and then she had many, many, many lingering issues, and it all ended up into seasonal allergies settling in her ears. And in one week's time, I brought her to urgent care twice and to her physician twice. And I have to tell you that getting somebody who's old and sick and on a walker, showered, dressed, fed, medicated, in and out of the car, in and out of the house, in and out of up and down elevators and waiting in waiting rooms and doctor's offices is not fun. Mm -hmm. But my reserves were totally depleted. And then I reached out to a former colleague whose question was very simple. Why aren't you using the home-based physician service that's in this area? Oh. Well, I had no idea that after talking to her primary physician – and researching the service, I discovered that they actually accepted her insurance and would visit monthly and more often if she had a medical issue. They managed her medications. They came to the house when she required in-home labs and blood draws. And for the next three or three and a half years, my mother never left the house for any of her medical care. And so a physician or a physician assistant visited every month and more often. And then I also got a little creative and found an audiologist who would visit to service her hearing aid. Mm -hmm. And I utilized those services until she was placed in hospice um, a month before her passing. So having an option to have medical services provided in my home really alleviated a lot of stress and was a comfort to both of us. Wow, look at that. And, you know, when you mention the hearing uh, disabilities after a while, uh, that's normal as people age, and then particularly upper 90s. Um, that makes it a little bit tougher, too, because now when you're talking regularly to somebody and you know that that, that person uh, has intelligence and, you know, they're right up there, they can understand, but they can't hear you well, and then you have to repeat, and sometimes uh, you start to get frustrated that way a little. Did you get frustrated sometimes, Eleanor, that way? Oh, you know what? It it um, um, we used to call it connecting the dots because she mm -hmm. had dementia, and then sometimes you'd speak. You you what you find, and you find this with elderly people in general, is you have to pe speak very slowly mm -hmm. and very distinctly. And then you kind of have to wait for the dots to connect and the light bulb to go on. And in my mother's case, believe it or not, I had to spell. Oh. And if I would spell a word out or I'd spell something out, then the light bulb would go on and she'd be able to carry on a conversation. I mean, it was, it was fascinating that somebody at 102 could still spell. <laughs> That's right. Hey, look at that. And so it was a double whammy there. Not only the <laughs> hearing, but a little bit of dementia that was overcoming her as well. At the end, the age-related dementia at the end is quite significant. But yeah. at 102, you should expect it. Look at that. Hey, people, and expect this. Your order for One Caregiver's Journey. you got to order this book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all online stores, as well as uh, Eleanor's website, onecaregiversjourney.com. And she is our special guest here today on People of Distinction with Alcohol, Eleanor Gassetta, and uh, the saga of caring for her mother, particularly over a nine and a half year period of time. Her mother died at 102 years old. So, wow, that's some wonderful caregiving that Eleanor gave her mother. Order that book, One Caregiver's Journey. And uh, we have some minutes left in the show. I want to take it out with a couple of things here, Eleanor. Mm -hmm. Um, one is you had mentioned, uh, before the show that your motto, I'll put it that way. Your motto is faith, humor, and love. We've talked about, you know, the faith that, well, you had faith that you could do it. Uh, let's put it that way. And you did it. 
and uh, you loved your mother, so love came into it. Where did the humor come into it? My listeners uh, would like to know about that. And caregiving, where does humor come in? Well, faith, humor, and love, frankly, should be the cornerstones of all of our lives, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I use the word faith not so much in the sense of, of religion, but um, in maintaining a positive attitude that as a caregiver, you're doing the best possible job you can to make your loved one's life you know, safe and comfortable. Mm-hmm. Humor. Humor is really probably the thing that keeps you from <laughs> – keeps your sanity intact. Right. <laughs> because it's important – um, because likely something will occur every day that will make you smile, and then in the end you're just thankful that you can find something to smile about. And there's some days that it's a little tough to find something to smile about, but mm-hmm. you just shake your head and go, wow. And it isn't meant to trivialize the heavy burdens that uh, caregivers often bear, particularly if you lived in the confines of four walls as I did for nearly a decade. But my mother always had a smile, and she sang in Italian almost every day, and she was happy, and humor was a natural natural occurrence for her. Um, And my book has a lot of humor throughout, from the good times and the bad times, when the natural response to a challenging situation just might have been, just shoot me. Mm, And finally, love is important because it's the main component in caregiving. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't be in the situation if you don't love the person that you're caring for. And while I didn't have a lot of physical help from family members providing care to my mother, I really received a lot of boatload, a boatload of love and encouragement and support for what I was doing. Absolutely. And I would finally interject that caregiving brings caregivers often to the cliff, the brink of the cliff. And I always and I always use the um, the the sage advice that God doesn't give you more than he, you can handle. And I always say, yeah, but he drags you to the cliff and then he pushes <laughs> the bungee cord over and then he brings you back. And yeah. if your life is great, grounded in faith, humor, and love, you know what? You'll always have that positive note to fall back in on those exhaustive and stressful days. Look at that. Well said. Well, Very okay. well put. And we love that. <laughs> People of distinction with Al Cole. Uh, two other things I want to get to quickly. Uh, I want you to elaborate on anything else you want to on your book, things that, uh, and particularly, maybe not just the caregiving they gave to your mother, but what you mentioned to me uh, before the show, 1.4 million young people. 1.4 million kids. Yeah, kids, children are when caregivers. Was, when, I was developing my, when I was developing the blogs on my webpage, onecaregiversjourney.com, I researched some of the common misconceptions that there are about caregiving. And according to the Alzheimer's Association, 1.4 million children in this country between the ages of 8 and 18 are responsible for or assisting with the caregiving of an elderly relative. And And as we talked earlier, I mean, that's a heaping bunch of kids that are missing out on after school activities and friends. Mm hmm. But more importantly, and I, I think of the responsibility that if, if a medical emergency occurs while a 10-year-old is caring for grandma, that's a lot. That's a lot to put on a kid. It certainly is. And, as, and, and everybody always thinks that women are all caregivers, but 75% of caregivers are women, but the 25% of men now are being forced to learn and embrace the role of a sole caregiver for an elderly parent or a spouse. Mm -hmm. And the reality, I think, is that the families today are faced with decisions of either becoming caregivers or to pay out of pocket to hire people to assist or to pay the cost in private facilities that can be as high as $12,000 a month. Wow. So I think financially a lot of people are being forced to, to... assume these roles it's just it's just the society that we live in i mean the costs and i will tell you that you know caregiving isn't for everyone i mean there's a lot of people you could have time patience distance uh financial uh work 
And one of the biggest decisions occurs in finding assisted living or nursing home care. My cousin and I were forced to find uh, assisted living for an, uh, my aunt, and we researched and visited 40 facilities in Denver within a two-week period. Wow. And my aunt's social worker would give us this information. And based on my sage advice to people that have to do this is be vigilant and pay attention to the residents living in those facilities. The first rule that I would say is that you want to ensure your loved one will be safe. Mm -hmm. And the second, and maybe the most important, is to let your eyes and nose be your guide. If a facility smelled or there were no smiles on the faces of the residents or the staff, we'd leave. Uh huh. That makes so much sense there. And one of the answers, too, and this gets a little bit political, but, you know, hey, life is political as much as anything else. Uh, yeah. Better care, a better health care for people, especially the uh, the seniors. Uh, not to expand too much on that aspect, because that's uh, going down a different road, but um, I guess you would agree with that just generally, that we need a, maybe a better health care system here, particularly for our older uh, citizens. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. And just because you're paying eight, nine, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a month doesn't mean they're really going to get any better care. Yeah. All right. So See, we... it doesn't it doesn't mean they've got a nurse assigned directly to them. It's they're in a facility and getting what everybody else gets. That's right. And that's why we like Bernie Sanders on people of distinction. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we throw that. We're very progressive oh. here. <laughs> now I got you laughing. I want you oh, now dear. another you very very uh, we're going to cap it off with some possibility thinking in a very serious way. That could add humor as well. One of the things that you you might not be asked so much when you go on other talk shows uh, is the question I'm going to ask you right now in possibility thinking. You, as the potential person that might need some caregiving, uh, ha you know, be the recipient of caregiving one day, uh, how would you, through your nine-and-a-half-year experience with your mother, the ups and downs, and the love, the faith, the humor, everything wrapped up. If it comes to it someday when you know, boy, I've got to rely on a caregiver, what would your advice be to that caregiver who is helping you at that time, Eleanor? Well, caregiving can very much be a challenge, but it also brings much joy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's not something you go into very lightly. I mean, I gave up a 40-year career, uh, a professional career, to to stay home and take care of my mother. But I believe you learn so much about yourself during the difficult times, and in the end, you do become stronger and more resilient and more caring as a human being. And, you know, make no bones about it, there's sleep deprivation, there's fatigue, there's anxiety, mental stress, and perhaps financial issues, which are added challenges to the workload of caring for someone you love. Mm. But in my, in my book, I remind readers that caregiving, like aging, is not for sissies. Yeah. Caregiving gives a lot of joy, and there are times when it's necessary to draw on the strength from the bottom of your soul. And the best part about caregiving was the opportunity it provides, it provides to grow, improve, conquer your fears and challenges, and um, I would hope that should I ever need need someone to help me, that that they would do it with faith, humor, and love. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be another just shoot me situation. <laughs> well, look at that. That's good advice to a future <laughs> caregiver out there for Eleanor Gassetta, who has been a wonderful caregiver. For her mother, her, who died at 102 years old after nine and a half years, nearly 10 years of caregiving from Eleanor, her daughter. Now, that is a testimony, and I'm going to cap it off uh, with uh, a couple of cents of my own. 
underscoring the great sense that Eleanor has been making all through the show with people of distinction. And uh, it's this. Hey, people, caring is 24-7. And it begins when you're born. One of the biggest things that we have in common, people, is that we are born babies. Nobody comes out of that uh, mature, big, bad age of 21 years old or 84 years old or anything like that. We grow into that. We start out as babies. And when that baby looks around, i got to believe that that baby, within you that might have said it, within me that definitely said it, and, you know, everybody, wow, I'm here, I made it, I'm alive. So that baby wants to be alive. That baby wants to give back to life the beauty of life itself and the saying, wow, thank you for my gift, gift of life. How can I serve others with their gift of life? And love is the thing that comes into it. Love is the measure of that baby, that love that that baby has for life. Now, that's the innocence of love, people. Let's keep it up throughout our lives. In terms of every once in a while, take some alone time. Get to know yourself and get to know some of the love that you've given, the love that you've received, and you're going to know that, wow, somebody cares about me. I've cared about somebody and maybe a whole bunch of bodies care about you and a whole bunch of bodies you've cared for too and now life is not that much of a challenge life is beautiful and life you can say wow you know there's that synergy between me and somebody else or many other people and then you can even go to nature the things that you love Ah, maybe uh you know the, the beautiful countryside maybe waterways things along that line The hobbies that you love. There are so many things that you love, people. Let's not put that to the back burner. Always have it on the front burner. What we love. And remind yourself every day about what you love and why you love these things and people and everything else. And why these things and people and every all of these things love you, too. And now we're saying, okay. So I'm going to keep that up throughout my life. And so you are giving care to people every single day and care to yourself. You're loving yourself and thereby you're loving others who you look at and you say, wow, you're not too different from me. See, that is a real people of distinction fellowship. And that's why I call my my show people of distinction. We're all in it together, people. Caregiving is every day of our lives to somebody that we love or many people that we love and letting them care for us too, giving and taking, receiving, hey, all of that. And as we do that, we're saying, wow, love is the measure of this caregiver and this caregiving beautiful experience of life that I'm having. And that's how we talk on People of Distinction with Al Cole, and especially when we have a great guest like Eleanor Gassetta, and she's the author of One Caregiver's Journey. you got to order that book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other online places that you can order it. And go to her website, onecaregiversjourney.com. And remember, she was brought to us by another caregiver out there with books. Reader's Magnet, one of the best with moving books. you got a book, you got to move. Move it through Reader's Magnet at readersmagnet.com. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for being my special guest on People of Distinction Thank with you Al for Cole. Me. Well, it was it was good. Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs>